Have you seen this? If you aren't one of the maybe 100,000 Australians who saw Money Movers in 1978, then you haven't seen the greatest heist movie to ever come out of Australia. Welcome to Have You Seen This? The world's only podcast about obscure, overlooked, and misbegotten media. All discussions will be spoiler heavy. You have been warned. And, yeah. And uh, for this episode, uh, I only know about this movie because of Doug Waugh, uh, who is the host of Friday Night Action on B-Movie TV on Roku. And for this episode, we have him as our guest. So thank you for coming on the show, Doug. Well, thank you guys for the invite here. It's uh, pretty much an honor to be on a different podcast as opposed to either on B-Movie TV or uh, the Slashers podcast, which I co-host on. So it's kind of, this is like new waters. It's nice. It's like jumping in, you know, full cannonball into something new here. But yeah, I, I, I'm honored to, basically, you said this is one of the greatest heist films you've seen, and it played on Friday Night Action. And uh, when I when I sh- played it on Friday Night Action, uh, this was actually the first time I had seen this movie as well, too. So um, for, for what Tim's referencing, B-Movie TV is a free channel on Roku, and you could download that um, anytime. Uh, ba- basically, it's, it's a 24-7 channel. We play a bunch of crazy movies, and on weekends, they're curated. So a lot of this stuff that you're watching on the channel, uh, you watch it with one of the hosts. Um, and so we get to experience it with you and get to explain a little more in the history of it. So it's like a dollar version of Joe Bob Briggs, if you will. Yeah, yeah. We are big uh, <laughs> B-movie TV boosters. I, I frequently reference that I'm watching the show like 16 hours a day. So I, it, it's on right now. It's City Limits, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, longtime listeners know of our deep and abiding love for B movie TV. Um, newer listeners might not know, um, but you cool people who are listening, who joined us at the five or even the ten dollar level, uh, know about just what an amazing channel B movie TV is. And um, Doug, I didn't realize that Tim uh, Tim found out about Money Movers from you, which that's awesome and i just want to say like this movie is fucking sick i loved it yeah this is a really underrated gem here too and the thing is it's um when we played it on the channel it barely it there was like a vhs release and uh like i believe an an overseas dvd release of it so there really wasn't much of it so this movie really went kind of unknown for the longest time but i noticed now umbrella entertainment uh they're putting out a special edition it's like 40 bucks a uh, blu-ray of this movie so um, you know, maybe it's finally getting its due. Uh, well, it is kind of a cult movie, too. A lot of people are fans of this film, but sadly, not enough. <laughs> That's yeah, but- great to hear because um, I went to watch this movie on Tubi, and I want to let our audience know, like, you can watch this free on Tubi, but I would recommend um, trying to get a DVD of it or maybe waiting for that Blu-ray because on uh, Tubi, it's full frame, plus, as I uh, bitched on Twitter today, uh, there is no closed captioning. Now, I'm not going to blame Tubi. I'll blame Shout Factory or whoever the fuck put out Just that blame DVD. the entire continent slash nation of Australia. <laughs> I mean, yeah, can you people learn to fucking talk, please? No. Um, uh, sorry, Wallabies. But um, as I was saying, uh, I started this on Tubi, and I got, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes in, and I was like, I'm sorry. I need subtitles for this. So I acquired a dvd rip with subtitles because otherwise i would not have been able to figure this out <laughs> yeah but yeah, yeah it's a, a lot Go of ahead. it's that that oi boy me, oh, this is a noise boy. a lot of them are just smoke <laughs> like they, the one guy's smoking <laughs> with a cigarette in his mouth and talking the whole time so imagine that it's like listening to popeye <laughs> yeah they're having an argy bargy about this high stiff yeah, exactly. It's like, whoa, she's a fine Sheila. She's <laughs> uh, other bloke. Uh, what a beer. Yeah, I'm pretty right. sure I heard someone say, I'm going to fuck this croco in the eye. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tim, will be, going? Tim will be uh, pinch hitting on the Australian slang uh, for tonight since he's actually right, been yeah. to Australia. Yeah, I'm down with it. Um, but yeah, like back to uh, Doug's um, uh, factoid about it coming out on uh, Blu-ray, like, 
yeah, Blu-ray is is good. I would like to see this in revival houses. I like to see this showing in theaters again because yeah, like it is uh like Doug says it is underrated. It's a hidden gem and um it is the kind of, you know, heist story that we don't really see a lot of anymore. It is a it's a really complex story with complex characters in it and everyone's got their angle that they're playing. One of the things too that I think Jen mentioned earlier is that uh, everyone here is just is dirty as hell. Everyone is a criminal. Everyone's like trying to like get you know like their own little payoff or or their own bribe or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's the one thing too. Um, you know, that's kind of like the odd exploitation kind of a uh, way of it too. Because there is a lot of like social commentary in here where you know the one police chief is like, you know, I've been working on the force for this many years, and I'm you know only making so much here. And then the people that are driving the uh, uh, you know, the armored trucks, they're just like, you know, I'm driving around all this money all day and I barely make, you know, a, a percentage of that. So yeah. mm-hmm. everyone's crooked. But what's crazy about this movie, I, 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 are you guys going to go over, like, the plot or, like, what's yeah. the structure? of? Okay, We can take a crack at it. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> this this movie is so twisty, too, which is Yeah, also I'll get out awesome. my cork board and all the red yarn and we'll, we'll try and describe <laughs> it. Yeah, when I first seen this movie, too, um, you know, back when I showed it on the channel, um... The, the, that's the thing. Like at first, I was like, "Oh man, this is gonna be one of those movies." Because sometimes Ken sends me movies um, that you know they, they're not all the greatest movies that play on, on Friday Night Action. <laughs> right. uh, so, so, so yeah, Friday Night Action is at eight p.m. on Roku on Fridays. Um, so we get a bunch of them that I that I do. Like there's some of them that are just like, "Oh my god, it's like a chore to sit through." And I'll, I'll go, I'll, like I'll bash the movie in the intro and outro too. So. Um, mm-hmm. But this one was the one that surprised me. I'm like, holy shit, this is like an early Martin Scorsese movie. It really reminded me of something like Casino or um, what's that one where they're, they're the nuns? Um, uh, the Town. So if you've seen that one there, it's a lot like that and very, very, very brutal. Yeah, I mean, I would compare it favorably with like Thief um, mm-hmm. or To Live and Die in L.A. Oh, yeah. Um, even like Heat or The Departed. It, it is that sort of structure where... You have a lot of different factors at play, and you're waiting for, you know, the one person to to cross the other one, and there there are these different factors where um, you aren't sure how each how each you know grift is going to play out. Like, who who's gonna um, you know come up worse for uh, for for you know their their uh, their their criminal enterprises? Yeah, and before we get into the plot, because um, it's a uh... It's a naughty one, um, very knotted. Um, I do want to point out that this movie was directed by Bruce Beresford, and if he's not uh, ringing a bell, um, let me just drop a heavy, heavy all-time classic on you. 1989's Driving Miss Daisy. That's right. He fucking directed that. Um, <laughs> so Yeah, it's, it's a lot like Driving Miss Daisy. A similar arc. But interesting thing about Bruce Beresford is that, um, you know, obviously Driving Miss Daisy was a huge success, like all the way up to getting a, a Best Picture or Academy Award. But um, he, Bruce, Beresford had had like a, a pretty long career starting on Australia, but had, I don't know if he ever really hit um this movie was actually considered a failure um it was maybe a little bit too pessimistic and and violent uh even for australian audiences apparently the year 1979 was like just a bad year for australian the australian box office in general but um the, the worst year they barely made like half their money back yeah and so this one didn't hit um Beresford also directed uh, Breaker Morant um, and Crimes of the Heart, which um, I think were kind of falling into that category of like, you know, hey, that was damn good. Didn't make any money, but it was damn good because apparently he did get work off of Breaker Morant because it didn't make money at the box office, but people were like, hey, that Breaker Morant film was really good. Um, he also did Tender Mercies with... Uh, Robert Duvall, which got a lot of positive press, but that's not exactly a blockbuster. It's, you know, it's kind of a quiet little film about, you know, uh, a country singer. Right. So, yeah, Breaker Morant has cast a, a big shadow, uh, not big, not so big that I've actually seen it. <laughs> right. Um, but having seen this, now I'm pretty curious to see more of uh, Beresford's filmography because, like, this is just, like, a really neat, tight cynical little caper film yeah 
and it is uh it really is set against a background of you know like i was trying to, to describe of you know theft and, and grift like everyone's looking for like a payout there's a guy selling stolen meat um <laughs> there's uh what like a a detective who takes you know a bribe from the you know security chief like you know i i I'd like to solve this crime for you but it's going to cost you that that kind of level of uh of um uh sort of off the books dealing is pervasive just everyone it, it, is completely venal in right this. yeah like even the even the quote unquote good cop like still admits to like you know getting the odd 50 pounds here and there um, right. Even though he took the fall for you know bribery scandal that was happening in his in his department. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that hit too, as opposed to like some of the what makes it so different from what what we showed on Friday Night Action is that this movie is just what makes it so brutal for me and kind of like a nail biter um, is yeah. that after that first heist. Uh, when they get back to the garage and they're like, yeah, we got the money. They open the fridge and they're sharing the beers and stuff. Uh, he just he has a hit on the other guys that helped him here too. And then the one guy just brutal suitcase. Like, all right, well here's your here's your deal here. Here's this. So it's like you never know who's gonna be hit next. Like like who who's teaming up with who? Who's gonna be whacked? You know what I mean? So it's like you did all mm -hmm. that work, and now you're just getting shot up in a garage. It's it's, it's yeah. scary to think about, and it's based on a true story too. So there you go. Yeah, this was apparent. Uh, this was based on a uh, book by a guy who started his own um, security company in the '50s, which was apparently um, a lot like uh, Darcy's in uh, the movie. Um, and it drew a lot of inspiration from a couple of real life heists. Um, now, my as Tim knows, like my stock and trade is mostly like um, grotesque, violent crime. I don't know a lot about like heists Oof, or anything yeah. like that. Um, but mm. um, you know, the kind of thing where uh, you know millions of dollars were stolen, and the big prize in this movie is twenty million dollars. Well, fortunately in California, twenty million dollars won't get you very far. Right? Yeah, <laughs> and, that, and that split four ways. That's that's forty percent of of twenty million dollars. Once the uh, once the mob takes their cut. Uh, one of the things, too, that I want to uh, mention about the beginning of this, and it's one of the things that, one of the many things that I like about this is that it is um, something that Breaking Bad does uh, just to, like, almost a pathological degree, is that there's a lot of, um, I guess you call it, like, business. Like, we aren't establishing characters. There isn't, like, a standout hero. It's like, oh, this is the star of the film. This is, like, their big emotional arc. It is kind of setting up all the dominoes to, to be like, okay, this is... You know, this is the counting house. These are, are the uh, you know, armored cars. This is, you know, the money moving through. These are all the people that are going to be involved in this heist. But you don't know, like, you don't know who your hero is. You don't have a clear idea of who the villain is. So in that way, the story is kind of keeping you um, kind of on your back foot. Being like, we don't know where the story is going to go because the characters don't know where the story is going to go. So it's all like, here's this. We're kind of laying the groundwork. And we're going to see these things kind of fall into place, and you're going to see them as it happens, but you aren't going to know where things are going to go as the story progresses. And that's that's one of the things that I really like about it is, is that it has a lot of that um, just sort of you're watching things unfold without knowing where they're going to go. Yeah, because, like, even the guy that you think initially is being set up as kind of a, a patsy, someone to, to pin it on, it turns out... Like, he's secretly working for an insurance company. Right, yeah. The one who's like, oh, he's a bit flash, but, like, where's he get uh, all I his th money from? Tim, I think you made a poofter. Uh, that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, um, and this is very much, um, and I think we're all used to the, um, the hard, muscly, masculine cinema of the 70s, but, you know, this being Australian, it's really, like, next level. <laughs> Like, in right, terms yeah. of being about, uh, and I love movies about, like, a masculine world, so, you know, this was a bit of a buffet for me, um, to see, like, these, uh, incredibly, like, uh, brutal and venal characters interact. Um, there aren't a lot of roles for women, but, you know, it's a security company in Australia in the 70s, like, what do you want? Right, yeah. Although there are a couple of, um, I don't know about a couple, there is one, um, there is one uh, role for a woman who is, uh, you know, kind of has her own ends. Like, she is also, like, uh, 
squeezing somebody for information. But I think we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, the other role with the woman was that one when that guy's, like, just kind of voice recording himself, and then he just, like, rolls his eyes when she opens her. I got a letter for you. Uh, yeah. I got to start this goddamn tape all over again. <laughs> yeah, and you can tell that um, the the woman they cast in that role is, like, very attractive, and it's like, oh, you know, this is the secretary that they hire because, like, she's stunning, not because she's, like, the best typist ever. Right. Um, but again, these are um, this is a, this is a brutal masculine world, <laughs> so that's what kind of what you get. Yeah, and she's the one who, um, when whoever the uh, you know the manager is of Darcy, you know Mr. Darcy, the, the uh, you know security company. Uh, ultimately, when he is presented with the information about you know who's who's the rat, because they establish early on that it's like the person who who robs the counting house isn't some guy who like waltzes in with a gun it's an inside job mm-hmm. and so the movie then becomes a matter of figuring out who is the who's the inside man who's the one who's uh, gonna who's gonna rob the place and already we've met um uh we've met uh jackson eric jackson i want to say eric, yeah eric jackson who you know he's higher up on the chain so as they established later in the movie, they're like, he knows as much about this place as, you know, the owner. He, you know, if he was going to be, if anyone was going to rob it, it, it could be him. Um, and, you know, then they also throw some shade on Leo Bassett. You know, he's the he's the flash poofter. Because it's like, he's got a lot of money and he's a new guy and he just waltzed in. Who's this guy? Um, and uh, then, uh, let's see, then there's the, uh, the old, like, retired uh, former cop. Um, let's see, uh, Martin who he's the guy who took a bribe. So already he's kind of um, suspicious. So you've got, you know, these different characters that that are all suspect in their own way. And um, like I mentioned, there's the detective earlier who's, you know, following up on, on different uh, 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 different employees to, to try and get some dirt on them. But yeah, it is that um, attractive secretary who is able to, you know, squeeze uh, Leo Bassett for information and find out that, yeah, he's actually an internal security person. Like, he's not just some some random guy who showed up. And it is kind of funny because, like, he doesn't appear to think anything of just, like... Just blowing his cover. I, yeah, just being like, well, I can tell you, because, you know, you're only a woman, but uh, she's, you know, she's being employed by Darcy to, you know, figure out, like, what's going on with this guy. So yeah, everyone in this has like a second uh, a second job. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, you know the their first be. job don't pay too good. <laughs> For real. No, that's why they're going to steal from these uh, payroll trucks. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So the uh, and and we get the um we get an idea of what what is at stake. We see you know the first heist go off, and it is kind of like that um, uh, uh structure that I point out in horror movies where you see like the first version of how it goes down and knowing how it's going to end, knowing how this situation ends. Now you're going to see it play out in, uh, not in real time. You're going to see it unfold the second time. And you know that, uh, a little bit of planning goes into robbing an, an armored car. Uh, someone is going to, is probably going to get shot. And then at the end they'll all be betrayed and then the money's going to disappear. Um, so you already see, you're already seeing a setup for for how the stuff goes. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the different uh, dominoes that are being set as the story goes on, because everyone is under a little bit of pressure from a different side. Um, you know, there are the uh, you know, there's Jackson and his brother um, Brian, played by Brian Brown, early in his career. Maybe um, the only actor that Americans would recognize. Would recognize. Yeah. Um, I think he's um, one of the. Um, because before Hollywood had like one jillion Australians running around, mm-hmm. like taking all the, the good roles in mainstream films, because uh, apparently like our American actors were a little too anemic. Um, yeah, there weren't a so lot of says it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> there weren't a lot of uh, you call that an actor. This is an actor. Um, <laughs> there weren't a lot of Australians breaking through to the United States. I mean, you would have occasional, um, uh, you know, hits like, I, I want to say like man from snowy river and stuff like that, like early in the eighties. Um, but I think, um, I think Brian Brown got popular on like, uh, the thorn birds or something like that. I'm a little fuzzy in my TV miniseries history, but 
he'll be passingly familiar to American audiences. Uh, the rest of these guys, I was like, uh, they're, they're all really good. Like, I kind of want to get familiar with the rest of their work. Like, you know, Terrence Donovan, who plays um, Jackson, um, you know, kind of the yeah. corrupt senior guy. Like, he's really good. And shows, like, a lot of, like, really amazing physicality. Like, I did not expect, like as much physical conflict in this movie as there was. But there was, like, a lot of, like, you know, not just, like, people getting shot, but, like, brutal fist fights. Oh, yeah. You'll you'll catch a beating at the drop of a hat in Australia. Just in general, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, like, them mo- most of the time in the movie, they're, they're all smoking or drinking a beer at the, so, you know, just to wake up in the morning and say, oh, okay, don't smoke on this. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's full of it. So. Just a, a quick fist fight to start your work day. Oh yeah. That, no, that's it's true though because light. there's yeah. that whole part in the um in the union meeting where they're like, you know, like we're not, you know, we're not going to be chained to the money. That's a violation of our individual rights. Um yeah. when uh Brian Brown's character um kind of mouths off to uh uh Dick Martin, that's Martin the ex-cop yeah. Martin's response is just to fucking punch him in the face. It's like, "Oh, there is no HR department." in this company yeah. like this is That's how Australian things get debate. settled yeah <laughs> yeah that, that reminds me of the cops from blood diner if you guys remember that where he's just like i don't like the way you're talking he just punches him in the gut so i'm like yeah this uh this uh, the australian pd is very much like uh blood diner so. <laughs> yeah it's very <laughs> very universe. direct yeah <laughs> yeah there's like um there there are so many like like big shattering punches in this movie it's uh it's one of the things which makes it so cool Right, yeah, because uh, what other what other fist fights are there? There are a number of them. Um, there's uh, yeah, there's Jackson throwing his weight around trying to intimidate um, Leo Bassett, the new guy, um, just uh, kind of giving him like like drop in uh, sort of uh, security inspections, but it's really him kind of casing the joint. Mm-hmm. And it's great because that goes really well with him, you know, pushing Leo around. And then, like, then the two of them go for a drive, and then they just, like, stop a robbery. They, like, crash the car through, like, this showroom window, and then just start beating up these hoodlums. That was wild. I was, and I think that was about the time when I was like, okay, I need subtitles for this movie. Because I was really, like, fuzzy on, like, what... Jackson's motivation was like I was like wait what's the story on this Bassett guy like what's happening and then I I got the subtitle version and right I restarted it and then it was like uh okay like you know this is this is kind of like Jackson like um I don't want to say like showboating but like you know he's yeah. kind of trying to make his impression on on Bassett and um I do like the way his advice to Leo Bassett comes back around because, um, as you'll recall, there's a point where he tells him, um, uh, where Jackson tells Bassett, he's like, oh, you know, if somebody sticks a gun in your back, you know, you just, you know, go around with stiff arm and, you know, disarm him or however he describes it. And then Jackson tries to pull the gun in the back thing on Martin and just gets his ass handed to him <laughs> like yeah. later in the movie and i was like oh shit like that paid off this is great i love it when things are set up and paid off in a movie well this will do it for you like i said i uh tarantino must have watched this one and not have given it any credit because there's a lot of stuff in this uh you know especially getting to the the um the the toe clipping scene you know there, oh, there's yeah. a lot of stuff like <laughs> reservoir dogs and uh y- you know because that's what tarantino does he takes a lot of his movies and uh he t- steals some of the ideas from these other ones here oh he um, absolutely yeah. watched this on a shitty he, vhs oh yeah and that's why I, when i'm watching i'm like man this feels like a tarantino i'm like wait a minute i shouldn't be saying this a tarantino rip this shit off yeah so, that's kind of tarantino's thing yeah, yeah like that's so wild that like you know tarantino ripped off bruce beresford because bruce beresford is credited as the screenwriter he adapted the book that it was based on and i'm like yeah well i mean death proof is just an adaptation of driving miss daisy you know that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah with extra yeah. foot fetish right so. yeah <laughs> and tim i know how much you loved death proof death proof was the last tarantino movie that i saw i i saw grindhouse and i was like okay 
I'm I'm done. I've paid my dues. I'm not going to watch any more <laughs> Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez movies. I'm done. Yeah, well, you didn't miss anything with uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I saw that in the theater, and I don't know. Like, maybe I wasn't on the juice that everyone was drinking. I saw that in the Arclight Theaters in Hollywood um, yeah. before they closed down. Everyone in the theater. In fact, uh, my, my wife and uh, our friend, they went with us, too. They fucking loved it. Like, this is this is Tarantino's, uh, you know, masterpiece. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck did I just... Did you guys watch the same fucking movie I did? Like, seriously, oh, my God. Like, this was two almost three hours of nothing until, like, the last ten minutes. Oof. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, Quentin, like, I get what you're saying, but I've heard it, and I I'm good. I'm done now, so... I'll get around to it one of these days. Yeah, I, uh, do it. Do it or don't. See if you three, like. Three three hour movies that aren't Lawrence of Arabia are a really hard sell for me. It's like your movie better be like fucking great before right. I spend three hours watching it. But that's yeah, just. Yeah, but me. I mean, yeah, and this is what a scant you know hour and a half or so. Plenty brutal. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Uh, like D- Doug mentioned, there is a a toe cutter scene. Oh God. Which. <laughs> yeah, which is is interesting because um you know the toe cutter is like this like uh urban legend I guess in Australia that that you know that's what you know the crims do when they come around if you don't pay your protection money they start yeah. cutting off toes which is like apocryphal apparently it isn't something that you know there aren't Australians walking around with like seven toes or anything but it's something that's just <laughs> enough that's like in the zeitgeist that everyone's like, yeah, you know, better watch out or you're going to meet a man with, you know, uh, some uh, bolt cutters and you're going to have to buy smaller shoes. First, yeah, that was uh, the name of the main baddie in uh, the original Mad Max was Toe Cutter. So, right, you know, yeah. The oh, are shit, onto you're right, here, yeah. So. No, for, you yeah. know, um, first they glass you, then the drop bears get you, and then they cut yeah. off your toes. It, it is a cursed land, yes. It's a brutal country. It is for it's it's a hard country for hard people. No wonder they're angry and fighting all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, because if the people aren't trying to kill you, then they got all these poisonous insects and animals that it will. So yeah, you know. yeah, like they even just boiling you alive. Yeah, they even have like they even have like venomous animals, like you know platypuses yeah, have like get, a poison. Getting killed spike. by a platypus, how oh, how shameful would that be? Can you imagine? Or, I mean, have you seen those kangaroos like up close in person? They got like Freddy Krueger hands, and you know, you know, the Australians are just out there punching them. So, right. <laughs> yeah, like um, I swear, like you'll occasionally see uh, like a photo will go viral of like a kangaroo, and it's just like it's like fucking ripped like a WWF wrestler from like the early '90s, just like, and it's like Jesus H Christ, like these things just run around. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just the yeah. six foot tall murder uh, rodent. Yeah, and you get the Australians like, oh, no, no worries, man. It's just a roux. A roux yeah. on roids. So. <laughs> a roided roux. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe, like, all these guys are, like, stealing money so they can get the fuck out of the country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could be. I, uh... <laughs> yeah, and it's weird, too, that they didn't lean on any of the roux or the drop bears. So that, maybe that's why it didn't do so well. Yeah, there you go. If it only had yeah. been more, a little more like Kangaroo Jack. Oh yeah, <laughs> cinematic masterpiece. Uh, well, see, then they get pissed off because they realize they went over to America or a different country. They're like, well, this is Australia. My your money's not good here. The right. conversion rate sucks. <laughs> <laughs> So we were talking about uh, different pressure on each of the different characters. Um, there is Jackson, who is definitely going to rip this place off, but he doesn't want any attention drawn to him. So that's why he's like, oh, what about, you know, Dig Martin? He like he took a bribe. What about Leo Bassett? Like, he's got all this money. Mm-hmm. And uh, also there is you know the union versus the, um, you know, versus the, the Darcy institution itself, because uh, one of the guys gets uh, gets. Uh, killed, you know, he gets clubbed on the head during a another uh, heist, and so they're like, "Well, you know, y- we don't want to work. You aren't taking care of us." And there's Darcy too. That's like, if we get robbed one more time, our insurance is going to go through the roof, and we won't be able to operate anymore. Then we'll all be out of work. So right. everyone is like under this pressure of like, I I don't want to do the thing that I have to do in order to keep functioning in this story. So everyone's like their back is up against the wall, like in, in all these different ways, and that's what I love uh, about that propelling the plot forward is like everyone is compelled to do something that is inherently dangerous to them. It's a pressure cooker. 
Right. Oh, yeah, and, and they don't care. At the end of the day, it's like, you know, I might die, I might not. At least they don't have to worry about the rent at the end of the day. So they just – they just no one cares about, like, the, the well-being of their own life. That's what I feel like, too. So <laughs> it's like they're taking the chance to get this money, but they're like, well, if I fail, eh, game over, you know. So we'll Yeah, it's, it's do or die mm-hmm. and then a lot of the story. Um, one of the uh, – Go ahead, Jen. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, that's another kind of interesting theme that you can kind of extract from it is how much the employees of Darcy are expected to put their bodies on the line for cash. Mm -hmm. Like, as we all know, like the usual practice these days is uh, like if you've ever worked retail, um, you see a shoplifter They're They're like, you know what? Like, just don't. Don't be a hero. Like, don't bother to tackle them. Like, it's not, it is not worth your life over, like, you know, huggies or whatever. Um, As much as, as, as much scaremongering as there has been in, like, kind of the, the mainstream media lately about, like, oh, shoplifting and criminality and vandalism are out of control. It's like, eh, you know, there's still a belief that human life is more valuable than property, but it's... Less so the case in this film because, you know, like I mentioned, like that there's a scene where it's, they were like, well, you know, we're thinking about chaining our employees to the money, mm-hmm. you know, and it <clears throat> occurred to me as I was watching the film, like just in the in within the universe of this film. Um, and Doug mentioned like how brutal like that first heist is um, where. Uh, those guys who were, like, hired to steal the money, they just get, like, murked as soon as they, like, try to relax with a beer. And it's shocking. Like, I, uh, it's a really violent, like, bloody death. Like, this movie isn't fucking around, and you're just like, God damn, like, these people just do not give a rat's ass about human lives. It's wild. No, what, what, makes it, what makes it scary, too? I mean, for me, like, when I first seen them, I was like, man, holy shit. Is when, uh, like, you know, like, in movies like John Wick or all these, when people get shot, they just die. Mm-hmm. Well, this yeah. one here, it's like it, the camera lingers on them agonizing in pain. Like, oh. Yeah. Like, like just dying Yeah, like, spitting up blood and, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, like, like, when. Flailing um, around. On that, fr- when, when they first hit the van and, um. That knacker man comes up to talk to Martin because he's like he's like <laughs> he's like slipping him legs of lamb on the yeah, side. Yeah, like leg of lamb, hey. Yeah. And then um, when that guy gets killed again, it's so shocking and bloody. Like he just shows up and he's like, "Oh, hey, Dick!" And then just blam, like they just blast his torso apart. Didn't even have anything to do with it. Yeah, yeah and he falls into the foreground, and then you see him like in the foreground, like against like um, you know, they're they're getaway car like taking off or whatever just this like bloody mass of like flesh it's like good god that is fucked up <laughs> yeah it is a brutal movie yeah and, yeah we had, and this is well before the toe cutting yeah um you ain't seen other, nothing yet yeah the other thing i know we're, we're jumping around all over the place but you know discussing the um uh the the dolan robbery uh or the how is it it's like the cosmetic whatever payroll robbery the the one where they get the fifty thousand uh dollars that's where it is a the security guard who is quote-unquote working late with his secretary okay and and it's like it's funny too because it is like such a sloppily run outfit too like the only reason that it gets hit is because uh that is like leo bassett like deserts his post to take a woman home which even if you know leo's you know sort of on the make it is him getting conned by this woman who's like, we need to get the security guard away from the front door so there's just the one guy that we can then break in and then steal the money out of the safe. And that is also an inside job from Jackson. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of uh, conniving around uh, around a lot of like sloppy uh, workers, too. People are just, you know, just having a, a shag while on the job, <laughs> taking someone home. <laughs> No, that's it's what, not and, a tight run outfit. <laughs> and that's what's great about this movie. And I think people will notice like those are the kind of movies that we love the most on this show are um, movies that are very cynical about yeah. people and their motives. Because um, one thing you'll notice about this movie is that, you know, like we said, like, you know, even uh, Dick Martin, the hero cop is, uh, you know, he has he has had a past of being a cop on the take. So, you know, he's not squeaky clean. Um, You know, like um, 
uh, sorry, what's his name? Barrett? Bassett. Um, yeah. Bassett is, uh, you know, like, yeah, he does his job, but he is just as interested in getting pussy as he is, like, you know, working for the insurance company. And all the way to the top. He's of, a complete man. Yeah, like all the way to the top of like the, the, the counting house and the security firm. It's like, I don't know, would you want to work for those guys? Because like, I wouldn't. Like, they're just like, they're just idiots. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, but that's how it is over there. You know, they probably all, they, they probably feel the same way too. They're probably like an idiot. Like, you want to know what? Everyone else is an idiot. This will be an easy job, you know. That's, that, that's kind of Fair point. It, so. Yeah. Where it's like, I see everyone, you know, dicking around at work and not really paying attention. They make a point too. They're like, yeah, the guys are storing beer in the, in the walk in safe. It's like, (laughs) what kind of work culture do you have here? And that is such a great bit at the end, like, after, like, the heist has been foiled and, like, a bunch of people have been, like, shot into bloody pieces. Um, That one guy, Conroy, got locked in the safe because he chose to come down to the loading dock or whatever, like, in an opportune time. And there's just an insert shot of him sitting on the cases of beer, like, drinking a cold one. He's going to be in there for, like, 18 hours or something like that because the lock is yeah. timed. <laughs> that is yeah, such see, a great I, I was waiting for him to, like, look at his clock. He's like, well, that's okay. I didn't clock out, so I'm just going to ride this out while the clock out. Yeah, right, yeah. He's so going to get time and a half for that one. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the interesting thing, too, well, interesting to me, is that that actor was also the lead in a uh, series called Bluey, which was another cop show that ran... Uh, a couple years prior to uh, to Money Movers, um, that uh, it's just you know kind of like I guess they're Australian Columbo or something. He's just the <laughs> kind of sloppy cop, but he gets results. Um, it's interesting as well that that uh, footage got repurposed into a satire called Barge Arse, which is just him being a, a sloppy, just even more disgusting cop. Um, it's no Italian Spider Man, but it's pretty funny. I think mm. I'm going to have to look that up and link to it, because that sounds fucking funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's the same people behind Italian Spider-Man, but it definitely treads in those same waters. I, Doug, I think you you must have seen that, because that aired on the channel. Yeah, I've seen Italian Spider-Man? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen Italian Spider-Man, I've seen Turkish Exorcist, I've seen E.T. the <laughs> Vagina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think E.T. the Vagina was like a Midnight Sleaze movie, if you've ever seen that. Costas Mandalore from the Saw movies is in that. That was his first porno kind of softcore thing. Wow. So. Well, I don't know I don't about you, that but one. that sounds hot, hot, hot. <laughs> yeah, he fucks E.T. E.T. looks like a trash bag in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> a, a sexy <laughs> trash bag. <laughs> when, um, I think I remember the last time that we saw um, Italian Spider-Man on B-Movie TV. We... You know, because uh, I would go over it's to like Tim's... It's like a fever dream. Yeah, well, I would go over to Tim's place and, you know, he would have B-Movie TV on constantly because, you know, as we've said, he watches it 16 hours yeah. a day. Um, and we're like, oh, Italian Spider-Man, like, that was pretty funny. Remember that? And then we both just kind of sat down. We got completely sucked into it. And we were, like, laughing our asses off. And we're like, damn, this shit holds up. This is really funny. <laughs> so, you know, that was a nice treat. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's some real gold in there. Like I said, this is one that just came across me, and I watched it, and I'm like, holy shit. This is, this is, so you do get some good gems on there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't want to digress too much here, but yeah, the uh, was it more of a fever dream than Pervy the Clown? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, Pervy the Clown, like if, if Videodrome were real and I turned in, tuned into Videodrome, it would just be Pervy the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay tuned then because uh, I'm doing a movie. I don't know if you saw my Instagram and Facebook, but I'm doing a movie called Trash Juice, and there's different segments. Uh, it's like four different segments, and per- I got Pervy and Kinky uh, to film something, and it's funny you said Videodrome because I'm making something very similar to Videodrome and Pervy. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm just dying laughing imagining um, Tim plugging into the into the vaginal like open wound in his stomach and like what he sees – in yeah, his like brain my face. television. Yeah. yeah, is is Pervy the clown and Kinky Candy? <laughs> yeah, and Pervy's just on the TV. Yeah, we're well, gonna have some text. <laughs> <laughs> Pervy, Pervy, no! I'll hail the new flesh. <laughs> Whew, just boy. just for forty minutes of that, just them <laughs> back and forth. Yeah. Well, funny thing about that too. I mean, I because I've met Richard and uh, Kinky before. In fact, we were in an episode. 
Um, my wife and I were in an episode. Well, y- Yahira, she does Saturday Night Terrors at 10 p.m. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she does that. And uh, we, we, we guest starred in a Pervy the Clown episode, I think, last Halloween. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just kind of like one of those things where it's like, man, you know, it's, this whole fever dream thing is, is real. Um, <laughs> I've never seen someone that can improv for two hours straight and not break character. <laughs> <laughs> now, I haven't seen that episode. I've only seen the uh, the four that have been filmed since 2017. Um, <laughs> has this one aired? Uh, yeah, it, it airs on Halloween. Well, good, then. You didn't see my dick, then. So. Oh, okay, well. <laughs> funny. I did see, I don't, uh, who was, I forget who the guests were. I think it's a guy, unfortunately, also named Tim. But it was him, and they were, you know, they had him tied up, and they were in the other room. And it was them, and, like, they had, you know, it was the, them, and they had another woman who looks like, I don't know, she looks like she was from a Nickelodeon cartoon. But anyway... <laughs> is them torturing him and this goes on for like half an hour and then like you hear the baby crying in the other room oh yeah that's cosmo yeah yeah but they keep rolling so <laughs> yeah they, they, yeah there's Bless some stuff in there like shut up like it's it's hilarious it's like man you can't you can't write this shit <laughs> <laughs> it is, well yeah i think I think it's like something that I told you, uh, or that I said to you uh, a, a while ago, is that there is nothing else on TV like Proving the Clown, and that's probably for the best. It, David Lynch couldn't even imagine that. That's, that's no, it's one of those true. Things. It's um, get some, get some rabbit heads on them. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, it is the definition of outsider art. Yeah. Well, when I when I post this stuff and I tell people like, hey, you know, Fred, I'm on Friday Night Action at eight. Um, you know, I have some friends and some people that watch it that are. Um, over in different re- uh, areas, and you know the Roku goes based on your time zone, and so mm-hmm. like, hey, I I tuned into your show, but I turned it on, and there was a pregnant clown girl dancing on a ball dildo. <laughs> 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 it was like oh, you, yeah, you've gone too far. Yeah, it's a little... like oh, you ran into pervy. <laughs> Sorry. <Right. about> that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is a uh, more you know tales of B movie TV. We had um, our friend Chris on to uh, uh, review the uh, a fan sequel to the ghostbusters movie Mm -hmm. uh he thought that we were just watching the you know the 2016 the the lady ghostbusters one but it's like no this was the one that your friend made that you hate um but he walked in and i of course had b movie tv on and they're showing the trailer for uh for the ilsa you know she will for the ss movie and i just have it on just not (laughs) thinking anything of it and he just walks in like oh oh this is how it is here Oh, I think was that uh, harem keeper of the oil sheiks? Was that the yeah. one that was on? Yeah, and they had yeah. the one, the one really large girl in the in the cage going like, Bleh, and she's like yeah. gorging food down her throat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, these these grotesque atrocities committed for the uh, sheiks, you know, uh, in, insatiable desires. I thought it was yeah. really funny that like Chris just assumed that you sit around watching like Ilsa She Wolf of the SS. <laughs> like, no, you know, this is this is just what I put on to relax. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just it's it's you know like how people watch The Office over and over again. I'm that way with the Ilsa series. Well, I yeah. mean, as I think people have heard us say, it's it's no Beast in Heat. Right. Oh, I love the Beast in Heat, but Ilsa does have the catchy catchphrase in the first movie, "Lick my kula." So. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if yeah, one day I... we're gonna have to break down and cover the Beast in Heat. Well, I I got it. I got the. DVD from Severin. It was like three bucks. So. Oh, for real? God yeah. bless them. I love. I, I th- love that they do that shit. Like, yeah. I, I mean, and, and the dialogue would be so easy to cover. It's just. <laughs> 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 and I swear I, that same actor showed up in uh, Salon Kitty because I mean you can't really mistake him for anyone else. Yeah, if you needed like a monkey man, he was he was your go to guy. I also, uh, amongst the, you know, the, the plot, I think, of, you know, Beast and Heat is, is, is really what separates it from the rest of the uh, Nazi exploitation movies. But I do like the part where a priest gets into a fist fight and punches out a bunch of Nazis. That's fun. That's a great scene. <laughs> That's, um, what, what other critique of fascism do you need, honestly? Right. See, that's Praxis. Mm-hmm. Punching that's exactly Nazis. That's right. But uh, back so to I the believe we're talking world about of <laughs> moving <laughs> money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't do it. It'll end up badly for you. There, I think we covered it. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. 
everyone wants in on this. So who knew that like carrying money would be such a lucrative thing? Especially like I, I kind of forget how did the mob even get word of of what was going on? They're like, hey, wait a minute, I want this. This is like a GTA six server or something, you know? So, yeah, GTA five. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah, and that is it is a complex plot, and it's the sort of thing that I think if it were made today, it would be a half hour longer, and there would be like a coffee shop scene of them explaining everything to the audience about what's going on because i mean i i've seen it three times and i'm still not really clear on how like cause and effect goes like like yeah it isn't clear how the mob finds out about this heist other than a guy gets observed going into another guy's apartment and like the night man catches him and then he rings up the other guy the, like this the the um the the sleazy lawyer who's who's kind of the guy who's doing the mob boss's dirty work through a lot of this he's the one who's like um he's there to pay off the the hitman when he kills the initial robbery team um he's uh like he's the one who who brings the two goons to to capture jackson when he goes to bug um leo bassett's apartment and those guys are the platonic ideal of goon oh yeah it is like a, a potato in a in an ill-fitting suit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has like that really shrunken in face, and like when he's going to cut his toe, you know, the mob boss is like, you know, I'm a businessman, I don't really like doing it this way, but go ahead, you know, he calls him out, and then he just gets so sad, when, like when he cuts off his yeah. first pinky toe, <laughs> he's like, that's fine, we'll negotiate, and the the look that Goon just gives him is like, that's it. <laughs> he's so crestfallen. <laughs> yeah, because those those insert shots of the goon, like when he's like he's just waiting for his boss to give the word to fucking start cutting off this guy's digits. He's so delighted. Yeah. It's just it's so upsetting, you know, because he he looks like a a you know seven foot tall root vegetable in polyester. Yeah, <laughs> he is. Yeah, he's the sort of guy that's going to enjoy this this sort of thing. So yeah, no small roles, only small actors, and he is an enormous actor. So. <laughs> you remind me of that guy in Leprechaun Three, the one that gets the coins shoved out of his mouth. So because that was another <laughs> goon too, if you remember that movie. That's I very don't, goonish. Yeah, but I don't know. Was yeah. was Three Leprechaun in the Hood? Or N- no, that's where he goes, goes to Vegas. Space. Ve- oh. Okay, space. Vegas is the third one. Yeah. <laughs> I, you Damn, know, he went more places than I did. Shit. Yeah. So, I love the one where he goes to Dollywood. I need I need a Leprechaun uh, Friday the Thirteenth crossover. Look, if Leprechaun and and Jason are both in space, they should meet. Yeah, and you know, that throw could, Hellraiser in there in while you're at it. Yeah. Yeah, might well, as well throw Pinhead in there. You know. Yeah. Exactly. But um. Although. Yeah. No, go ahead, Doug. Please. Oh no, I was just saying, Leprechaun's a cool guy though. He's out of all the horror people, I'd rather hang out with him. All he wants is. Yeah, all he wants is his money. He's a lot like money movers. It's like, hey, take <laughs> take my fucking money. I'll rip your fucking finger off. It's like, Leprechaun, yeah. you're a good dude. I'll drink I'll drink a pint with you. So he knows what he's about. Yeah, you know, if you don't cross him, you can be mates. No, yeah, like there's there's a uh, you know his very straightforward guy. So Jackson, he's been working on this heist uh, on his own, like independently, and then the mob finds out and cut to like another brutal fight scene of him because he gets maced basically at bassett's place and then gets hauled back to you know the mobster's house and they you know try and uh cut a deal with him and he just fights his way out of it uh and he and he nearly makes it and then that's when they like bring him back and then they they take his shoes off and and one of his toes along with it that shit was wild too because it's like he fights through like 10 guys with his hands literally tied behind his back and he makes it out of uh, I think uh, yeah Henderson the the mob boss's house and mm-hmm. you know he's rolling down the hill and you think he might almost make it but then you know like five guys jump him and like drag him back like and that's another thing which uh, another theme which we delight in on the show and I think we talked about this um, we talked about Michael Mann and we briefly touched on Thief is that idea that there's always like a bigger fish. You know, because oh, like Jackson is a very dominant character, very single minded. Um, he's been working on this heist for literal years, um, you know, admit with his his brother, uh, Brian, Brian Brown. But yeah, they're building a fake armored car in his shed, which like, is that's dedication. Yeah, that is wild too. like. But, you know, for a payoff of millions of dollars, like you understand, like why there's this you know, outlay of time and resources, because this is going to be like a big, big jackpot. And 
he's such a commanding guy. He's got his fingers in so many different pots. Like he's always like, you know, a step ahead, thinking ahead. And then Henderson steps in. He's like, give me a cut of that. Like you do the work and like, you know, just uh, take a fair percentage. And it's like, God damn it. Like, (laughs) you know, you you bust your ass for years, like putting this heist together. You build an entire fucking like fake not a fake car, but like a you know fake armored car. Like, yeah. uh, yep. your boss some... makes a dollar, I make a dime. Exactly. You're like obviously some kind of like you know like judo master, you know, because you can fight off like ten guys with your hands tied behind your back. But no, like he's this... the average drunken Australian man. Like, that's, <laughs> they're just that <laughs> they, good. They have and, no fear. And what was the percentage? Did, uh, I'm trying to remember the mob. Was ridiculous. Person, was like sixty percent. Was it sixty percent? He wanted, it was. Or... It was two thirds to start, and mm-hmm. then he left him with like. He he cut him down, no pun intended, to only taking forty percent. Like their end of it is forty percent, right? Sounds Which like is the credit cards now, so. right? Yeah, <laughs> a little a little steep. But, but yeah, like Jen says, is there's always a bigger fish because yeah, Jackson had um he had this whole thing planned out, but and it's like he seems like a legit guy who turns out to be a bad guy who turns out to meet an even worse guy. <laughs> So that's kind of the progression of it. Like it, 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 it expands. It, it, it works on on bigger levels. It, it, it ratchets up. You know the stakes every time you you introduce like a new character or a new angle. And I think that's what makes this movie so unique is that every single character, uh, like you said, it's the bigger fish. Yeah, that's what just makes it so great is that um, you know every single character in here is has an as like you said another job. And uh, they're all brutal to one another. Like, you never know. Like, literally, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, watching it again, I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised if all of a sudden another character just came out. You meet a new character. And then all of a sudden that new character is introduced for maybe five minutes. Just gets his head blown off or something. Right. So it's like, oh, this was my job. I was actually planning this the whole time. Right. Yeah, you do find out that there are – there's another angle to every character, like, the more you get to, to know them. And, in fact, like, Leo Bassett, because this whole thing is set off by an anonymous note saying your count house is going to be robbed. And that was Leo who <laughs> sent the message to insinuate himself to flush out whoever was going to rob the place. Right. And no one knew because everyone was suspect. It's like, <laughs> that's why you didn't know. Like, you were just as in the dark as any of the characters are supposed to be because... If you tip off any of them, you could be tipping off the guy who's going to do it. So he has to play it really close to the vest. Yeah, because, like, Darcy is, like, uh, he's really pissed. At the, he's like, you know, well, you could have let me in on that. And then, and you know, Bassett's like, you were one of the suspects. Right. Like, it was obviously somebody on the inside, you know. A few people would be in a better position than, like, the guy running the company. To like you yeah. know knock over a few of his own fans so yeah, yeah like everyone is on the take in this movie and as the the plot progresses you see that you know their problems are introduced and solutions you know have to be cobbled together while the clock is ticking so you're getting these plans and these complications which i don't know if i can introduce traveler one more time but that's <laughs> <laughs> that is a good story. It's where you think you've got everything planned out until the r- rubber hits the road, and then you're like, oh, this is actually a completely different scenario than what I expected. And and Jackson gets some of that because he's used to this whole time just going over and, and kind of knocking Leo Bassett about because he's the new guy until he meets, you know, Dick Martin, and Dick Martin completely, like, outsmarts him and has, you know, basically has him under his thumb. Like, he... Uh, Jackson has met his match when it's him against Martin because Martin is a former cop and he he is not one who's like easily fooled or you know pushed around the way that Jackson's done to all these other uh, security guards in this force like you see that they're shaping up to be um, adversaries whereas Jackson who's trying to get away with who's trying to let he's been kind of fast talking his way through so much of this but Martin just is not having any of it like, even, like, if you're a guy dressed as a security guard, if you're coming out up to do, like, you know, a, a surprise inspection, he's like, no, surprise inspections are first cleared with, you know, our central authority first, and also, why the fuck do you have a lockpick kit on you? <laughs> <laughs> like, you are up to no good, and you're trying to talk your way out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's Australia, so I would have imagined they would just go, like, oh, okay, well, that's okay, you'll be, you'll, we'll, we'll nickname you Lockpick and just let it be, so, you know. Right, yeah, she'll be right. Who, who doesn't have a Lockpick, you know, kit on them for one reason or another? 
It's always a special moment in an Australian child's life when they get their first lockpick kit. <laughs> yeah, I was well, you know, I'd wait for one scene where it's like, that's not a lockpick. This is a lockpick. <laughs> 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 their first lockpick lock pick kit and their first can of Huntsman spider repellent. Yeah, there you go. Actually, well, those, I think... those aren't venomous, are they? The big ones? I thought uh, Huntsman I... spiders were. I'm not going to risk it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm thinking of the you're thinking of the, those orb weaver spiders, the ones that are the size of your thumb. Those yeah. are venomous. Yes. Wait, orb weavers are venomous in Australia? I guess. Jesus Christ! Wow. And I'll I'll show you a picture of one, and you'll be like, "No, that is not like up close. That is far away." Yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah, actually well, if you two wanna, feet across. <laughs> if you want to really scare yourself, you'll see how it is. Like in the morning in Australia, people sometimes have to take a can of compressed air. And spray underneath their uh, door handles. Uh, there's a video. Just type in Huntsman Spider. The guy sprays conde- uh, canned air on there. Big ass Huntsman Spider just falls right down out of there. <laughs> That's yeah, what you get in Australia. God. Because they'll just like hide like behind a painting or like you know a mirror or like some nook in, in like your ceiling corner. And then like because it's a big spider, sometimes they'll lose their grip and you'll just be sitting there and then just thump. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's the spider. God, and then the well, spider wonder... gets up, dusts itself off, so says, "Oh, good evening," and then it just skitters on its way. Yes, yeah. Well, I wonder if there's like a, been a lot of like car accidents um, in Australia because of that. Like, because uh, I've seen videos too where people are driving and they t- put down their mirror, and a huntsman spider just falls right <laughs> in their laps. <laughs> God, I'm shitting my pants just imagining it. Let alone if it happened to me. Fuck. Right. Fucked up I thought country. that did happen to you. Not a not a huntsman, but like, well, any spider when you're driving a car is an unwelcome spider. No, yeah, there was that time I I, I got into my car in the in the morning after I was on my way to work, and I had just walked through the the front yard of my apartment complex, which and it was fall, which is like orb weaver season. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the very they're harmless, but they're big spiders, and they build huge webs like stretching really far and you know you'll see them out of the corner of your eye and it's just like oh yeah it's the big spiders so i get in my car and i i am geez this is so long ago i I was messing with my ipod in the car and i look i happen to glance down at my right shoulder and there is a fucking orb weaver spider with, with a body like the size of a quarter like crawling up my arm like toward my shoulder and I just like I just went and like flung my arm out it like flew into oh good the, my uber's here yeah it flew into the back landed on like the sunshade that I had like in the back seat and then I just grabbed it and like flipped it out onto the concrete and for the rest of the day I was just like unconsciously wiping my arm with my left hand just like bleh, bleh. Yeah, like that's <laughs> that sticks with you. And in fact, like I have goosebumps telling the story because that's how much it freaked me out. <laughs> well, you got your little uh, piece of heaven from Australia. That's kind of how, yeah. you know, that's a demo version of that. So. It was a spiritually Australian moment. And uh, yes. this is a spirit. This is a uh, this movie is positively resplendent with the spirit of Australia. Wouldn't you say, Tim? <laughs> yeah, everyone. It is a criminal. Um <laughs> So, so you've got uh, you've got Jackson and, and Martin at odds. Uh, Martin is proving himself to be capable, and he's helping to kind of shepherd Leo Bassett along into becoming you know more of an active security guard. Even though Bassett's got his own angle that he's playing because he's secretly you know like his internal uh, security guard. Um, so things are shaping up where uh, they do briefly uh, you for the audience's benefit explain what the heist actually is, and it is. We're mocking up a truck, and we're going to pretend to be the other truck before the other truck arrives. God, I wish the movie had explained it that simply. Um, <laughs> but uh, before that happens, uh, you, like the the mob boss, uh, he, like he weighs in and he gives his two cents. You know, it's management; they've got to you know put their stamp of approval on it. And that I mean that means including a bunch of the mob's own the mobster's own guys. And you see a familiar face. You see that little, like, you know, monkey-eyed, you know, uh, shrimp guy (laughs) who you will recall as the cold-blooded murderer from the beginning of the movie. Dino. Dino, yes. Who 
the uh, who Henderson introduces as um, uh, none of my jobs could have been successfully concluded without him, which is a little huh? <laughs> like we yeah we're seeing how this how Henderson is expecting this job to be concluded with uh, with all the uh, all the participants being murdered in a tire yard. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, and even bec- and the uh, the sleazy lawyer is great too because uh, again Henderson describes the the plan where he's like, "Do your robbery. I don't need to know the details. You'll go to a tire yard that I own. At that point, uh, my associate you know, Ernst will take over, <laughs> and like we've seen Ernst take over by shooting everyone. <laughs> so, so even if this heist is successful." It's possible that these guys are all doomed anyway. So they're they're driving towards this inevitable conclusion mm-hmm. that is just not going to end well for them no matter what they do. No matter how well off the heist goes, they're dead basically. <laughs> but they're they're committed at this point. Yeah, and that that those last 10 minutes of this movie, holy shit. I remember just watching I'm like, "Oh my god, like no one's going to survive off of this here." Oh wow. Like yeah. Like, the ending's such, like, an Australian, like, rush. You know what I mean? Like, that's... <laughs> oof. I, yeah. Are you going to explain the ending? Because there's so much that happens real quick, too, so... Right. And the ending, too, like, just before they go to pull off the heist, uh, I mentioned Heat earlier, and kind of the, the, the core tenet of, you know, uh, Robert De Niro's character in Heat is just, like, you know, you can't have anything in your life you can't walk away from in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And... And that's kind of what all of Heat is built around. But this, like, that is, like, one scene in three cutaways. They do that same theme where it is Jackson, like, him, you know, closing the door on his wife. It is the old guy being like, well, I guess maybe I'll have a better time in Thailand fucking underage girls. Because apparently that's what he does. Yeah, he Uh, mentions, uh, it's really, um... Yeah, no hanging around with teenagers. I mean, I guess it's, uh, (laughs) uh, maybe it's... Maybe it's sweet in, uh, you know, if you're in that particular relationship, but um, Mm -hmm. he describes his uh, South Korean girlfriend as, uh, you know, soft and warm like a mouse's ear. And I'm like, yeah, God. (laughs) This is Harvey Weinstein before Harvey Weinstein. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) And then the way that Jackson just like, you know, walks out on his wife is just like, eh, you know, she can, you know, she can marry her fucking dog if that's what she wants. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and Brian Brown, his character is like, yeah, I just want to talk to my girlfriend for a while. It's like, uh, like, what's well, what's up with you? Like, going out? I'm like, all right. Yeah, like, ever, uh, like, uh, and I, I don't want to say that you know all the characters in this movie are sociopaths because you know that's not true. But I think it's more, you know, you don't even have to use like psychological terms. It's more just like everyone has this singular focus on getting a big payoff and getting away yeah. scot free. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is very pragmatic. It is uh, a matter of commitment. They're singularly focused on the task at hand, which, as Doug mentioned, it it goes wrong in a couple of ways, and then it just turns into a bloodbath. Yeah, which you you're kind of. Uh, I mean, you're kind of excited for, like, as a movie viewer, because you know right. when. Um, you know, the mob boss gets cut in on the deal. Um, he's going to take his cut from from Jackson, and. You know, they get to the day of the heist and, you know, everybody like puts on their uniforms or whatever. I'm just thinking like, oh, man, this is just going to end up a bloody mess, isn't it? It's going to be it's going to be awesome. (laughs) Like, you know, it's going to happen. And um, it's I don't want to say it's 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 gratifying because often like as a movie viewer like you, there's always the part of you that wants um, the people that you've been watching to get away with it. Um and sometimes it does happen. I mean, you know, like uh, Kathleen Turner, like getting away at the end of Body Heat and, you know, moving on to the next mark. Um, but in this case, I'm like, I know that there's going to be like a huge bloody ending. Like people will die. You know, it's just the way it's going to be. And it's going to be brutal. But it's um, it's also just such a crazy, intense and well shot scene. Yeah, and uh, one thing away from, like, uh, you know, some of the action movies that we've shown before, too, and, like, what makes this so impactful is that, uh, you know, the director made it seem every bullet hit counts. 
Like, it's not just, like, a throwaway, like, oh, oh, oh. No, this one's, like, you feel the pain of these characters. Like, they're sitting there screaming, like, their facial expressions. The acting's really good in this film, by the way, too. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah. yeah, every bullet hit you take, I'm like, man, that's got to hurt. Like, you could feel, like, the burning and, like, the muscle from each shot there. And it lingers on their pain, so it's like, man, you know, this is not going to end well. You know, not at all. Fuck, I wouldn't want to. Getting shot with a silencer, too. You know, that one guy's going crazy with a silencer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Someone there gets are... shot in the ass, too. I remember they're, like, underneath the table and gets shot right in the ass. <laughs> and these are, like, not, um, these are not fights where the outcome is certain. It, there's a lot of back and forth where it's, like, one, one side gets the, um, <clears throat> gets the upper hand, and it, it, it seems like it's a done deal, and then the other side comes back, and there's a lot of back and forth with it. There's, um... Yeah, it, it starts with one of the guys, uh, regular guys working at the count house is like, he's supposed to go away while they steal everything, but he's not. And then you've got, you know, the assassin where he's like, you know, he's screwing the silencer onto the gun. Like, are we going to yeah. shoot this guy? Um, you have, um, you know, the the uh, higher ups waiting outside the door because they've been locked out while, you know, this this melee is going on. Um, you know, there is... Uh, whether whether you're armed or not, or just like you know throwing fisticuffs, you know um, Martin, you know the ex cop, like he is he is just like handing out beatings left and right, and I don't think like he even has a gun for much of the time. Bassett like his gun is empty, um, and because he's the poof who doesn't like guns, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's like he's like kung fu. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So it just it it goes back and forth, and it is. Up until the point where, um, for whatever reason, you know, Martin is hesitant about shooting, you know, uh, Brian Brown's character. Uh, and for that, Jackson shoots him in the fucking back. Yeah. It's awful. You see him drop. Um, but, and yeah, like, like Doug is saying, like, each of these, you know, bullet hits count because then, you know, Martin isn't completely down. And then when, you know, Brian is going to open the gate, he gets shot and, like, We've seen them linger on shots of, of, you know, people being shot. Uh, but yeah, the one on on Brian at the end, you're just like, this guy is in agony. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just dying terribly from being, you know, shot in the spine or what have you. Um, yeah, which I kind of, I kind of like to see in a movie because as much as, um, you know, that kind of uh, gore and pain is hard to watch. It's also nice to see a movie which doesn't treat this kind of violence as as trivial and i'm not opposed to stylized violence in film or kind of glib treatments of it it really depends on the movie it depends on the tone it depends on so much but it is nice to see a film which is not afraid to be like yeah like like this kind of violent death like really fucking sucks like it's it's agony it's painful it's it's bad. I mean, like when that um, when that one guard Dolan gets killed, you know, the guy was just like doing his job, and you know he gets uh, yeah, I think, he gets bonked on the head. Yeah, and um, I think Jackson just kind of hand waves it as like, oh, you know, it was an accident. I didn't mean it. Like he knew the guy, but yeah, you know, he had uh, he had an aim that he wanted to achieve. He needed this like you know relative chunk yeah, he was change. Committed to his goal. Yeah. Yep. For, um, cause he, you know, he had like expenses and, you know, for setting up the big heist and he's like, well, you know, like, yeah, I, you know, fucking killed him accidentally. What are you going to do? And it's like, God damn. Yeah. It's, you know, cause and effect plans and complications. It's, it's a complex story. Then, you know, that's what I really respond to about it because yeah, there are people dealing with the consequences of their actions constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and see, what's crazy for me, like, I, maybe I was overanalyzing this too much, but when I watched it a second time for the podcast here, it was just like, you know, all these characters in the ending, you know, if, if you were to really break it down, all of them had different reasons in their head. So they're thinking in their head, it's like, oh, when I get this money, I'm going to do this. I'm doing it for this reason. I'm going to do this with this. I mean, and, and then in less than five minutes, everything is just all those dreams and ambitions are, are shot dead to the ground. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it right. just shows you how pointless and how fast life can go like that, you know? Yeah, it goes sideways in a big way. And even to the point where um, when it is who we have uh, come to realize our protagonist and antagonist are, you know, Leo Bassett and Jackson, and it's the two of them, you know, fighting amongst each other. 
um, it, until I think it is Bassett that gets shot, and then it's just a Jackson left. So it's like there's still you know a narrow path to victory here. Um, but uh, I believe uh, Bassett unlocks the door and lets the you know administrators in, and they know what's happening. And then it is a character David who is kind of minor. But speaking of, um, you know, everyone kind of like double crossing each other, uh, just like um, like Jackson uh, clubbing Dolan over the head. Jackson has a relationship with David. Maybe it's just professional. Maybe David's in on it. But David shoots the shit out of Jackson. <laughs> he like empties his revolver in, into Jackson up against the side of the armored car. And here's the question that I have. Is that to protect himself? To ensure that Jackson dies and doesn't say anything about who set this up. Oh, oh I... I think so. Yeah, he was just, he's like, oh, these bullets are expired. I'm just going to unload them now, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little different interpretation because of uh, a couple things which happened earlier in the film. Okay. Um, when he shoots Jackson, it it's like this act of, like, incredible rage. It's like, um... You know, what they, what they call, like, overkill in a murder, you know, when you stab somebody, mm-hmm. like, 47 times, like, oh, obviously it's personal. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a hint earlier in the movie that, um, you know, like, for example, like, there's a scene where uh, Jackson goes to his place, like, after, um, like, he, he, Tim, remind me of where that happened in the movie. It's, uh, he gets, uh, Jackson gets injured and he goes over to... Uh... Yeah, that's after he gets beat up by Martin. Right, yeah. Because he goes over to his place, has a beer, and he's bitching about, like, yeah, you know, I, you know, I got caught by, by Dick Martin and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there's a moment where... Uh, shit, what's the other guy's name again? The Welsh guy. What, David? David, yeah. He, um, he says to him, like, no, you know, stay. Have another beer. And there's, like, there's this weird little moment. You know, where he's, it's like, wow, he's, like, really hoping that Jackson stays and has another beer? Huh. Okay. That's interesting. And then later on, there's a scene where they're talking about, um, they're talking about, like, the backgrounds of the employees and, like, who might be in on, you know, who might be, like, the inside man. And, you know, most of the employees of Darcy uh, are you know, people who kind of failed at law enforcement <laughs> and so went into being yeah. a security guard. But they mentioned, like, the thing about David is, like, um, there was some kind of a, like, uh, God damn it, what was it? Like, he was married, but he was, like, he got popped for, like, a morals thing. Like, he was having, like, he was having a relationship with a man. Oh, I didn't catch that. Right, and um, I, I wish I could remember it better. Um, but I swear to God, there's a part where they say like, "Oh yeah, like he, you know, he because you know Martin got, you know, had to resign from the cops because he was taking bribes. Like you know, David had to leave his job because like, oh, like he was having a relationship with a with a dude, and it's like, oh, like shit, like maybe he had a thing for for Jackson and. You know, like, that rage that he expends, like, at the end of the movie is, like, just a feeling of, like, intense betrayal. I could see that. That definitely makes sense now, so. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I I mean, if I'm remembering the bread comes, crumbs right, I feel like that's, like, the, the, the tr- because that stuck with me, like, the moment when he's at David's flat and, and David's like, no, eh, stay, have another beer. And it's like, that's weird. Hmm. Like, you know, these don't strike, they, they didn't strike me as like, you know, chummy guys, like mates, you know, right. but it's like, huh, why is it, why is it, you know, and like as a, um, you know, especially like 1979 Australia, like, you know, a bloke asking another bloke to stay for another beer, bit sus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, cruising did come out a few years later, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Really opened up Pandora's box, just just gaped it wide open. <laughs> mm-hmm. I kind of like that because, um, like, and there's no, um, you know, there's no judgment to, like, that whiff of homosexuality. Like, if I'm interpreting right, it simply is. And it just is another, like, character interaction which adds kind of to the fabric of this movie. 
It's like, oh, like he had a thing for this guy. And then when he finds out like just what an incredibly like, uh, you know, venal criminal he was, then he fills him full of lead. It's like, damn. That's brutal. Also a valid reason, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, all these characters, like, they have their own motivations for whatever reason. Everyone's everyone's got their angle that they're playing. Yep. And that's what makes this movie so good, too, is that you can watch it multiple times and pick up something new with each viewing, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is such a, 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 a tight story because I am, like, as I'm taking notes to make sure I understand what thing leads to the next, I know that there are other things that I'm missing. But yeah, if I go back and watch it again, I'll be like, oh, okay, this sets up that other thing. It's very, it's a very economical story that everything you know leads to one thing, and you you do have to fill in some of the gaps because it's really fast paced too. It, it mm-hmm. moves by really quickly, and I you know have a hard enough time paying attention to like a podcast that I might be on. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, to have to pay attention in the movie and be like, okay, this is setting up that. We know what this guy's about. We have to understand this person's motivation how it relates to the other person. It's very complex, rich, and satisfying movie to to engage with. Yeah, and in a movie with so few, like, um, you know, people get so concerned with like, oh, well, are the characters likable? Um it doesn't fucking matter, especially not in a movie like this one. Yeah, you you determine whether or not you like them by what they do, basically. And yeah, no one has like a big melodramatic turn, like oh, once I get this twenty million dollars, I can pay for my mom's cancer, or some you know something like trite like that. Yeah, because like even Martin, who is um, you know, like nominally a good guy, because he wants to stop this heist. You know, there's still that suggestion of him like taking bribes, and like you know, he's an ex-cop. I mean, like these aren't right, like yeah. squeaky he, clean people. Yeah, he has uh, you know, like bitter relationships with his former coworkers, because like, oh hey, guy who sold me out to protect the rest of the department. Oh Maybe yeah, guy. Like, cause um, and you think that this movie is gonna be like a. You know, it's just going to be like a straight A cab movie, which is like, um, you know, look at how like corrupt like law enforcement is. Like these aren't good guys, like you know, in white hats. You know, everybody has their own motivations, but it's everybody. It's like everybody, like yeah. in the security service, the counting house, like the union. Like the union is incredibly corrupt, and you know, this isn't about like, um, you know, improving the lives of the workers. It's like basically like serving the needs of the bosses. Right, yeah. Very cynical even, like, film. The, the, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it just shows that even the higher-ups, too, you know, the bosses were all planning that, too. So it's like, man, you know, people are just working, you know, regular minimum wage jobs, uh, you know, to kind of support themselves. And, you know, here you are you thinking you're doing good for the better good of the company. And here they are. They're the ones, you know, in charge of robberies and, and, and yeah. theft and all that, <laughs> right. you know, so... Yeah, and and we tie it to tie it back to the cops at the end too. Like the real, you know, uh, sucker punch at the end is after this has all been laid out, and Jackson kind of has his little insurance policy, of you know he has the the note, uh, you know, fingering Henderson on yeah. him, and the cop finds it. I, I believe it is you know a detective, and he finds it, and he rings up Henderson, and he's like, "Hey, how much to keep your name out of the papers?" And That's so good, and it makes me think of um, a similar moment in, but well, the end of To Live and Die in L.A. when you realize like John Pankow is just falling into the exact same role that his dead partner did. Yeah, like he is also going to exploit this woman and just like you know pursue his own ends, and it's again so cynical. I love it. <laughs> yeah, everyone's just looking out for themselves in all this. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that's probably the most uh, insight we've done on a Friday Night Action movie here. I'm like, man. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, uh, I was going to say, too, if you guys wanted even more insight, I'm looking on Umbrella's website right now. Uh, they're the uh, ones putting out the the Blu-ray that comes out mm-hmm. August 3rd. So there's a brand spanking new 2022 roundtable discussion with the director, uh, Bruce Beresford, and Terrence Donovan and, and uh, Tony Bonner. So you do get you do get – uh, interviews with the director about this movie so i know he's been a little elusive on what he what his thoughts were but more than just us uh, yokels talking about it yeah yeah you get a nice little <laughs> poster in there too uh, you get your toe clippers so <laughs> <laughs> well i this is uh, again b movie tv continues to pay dividends i would have known about this if i hadn't been watching friday night action with doug so uh 
yeah thanks thanks for being on the show thanks for talking about it with us uh, is there anything else that you want to mention well thank you guys for inviting me uh onto the show this was a real uh, nice treat here and anytime we get to do uh basically go into more detail on you know movies that we've shown on the channel i love that because a lot of these movies i'm seeing for the first time too um i guess there is one other thing too so there's another movie if you guys watch b movie tv um i it one of the episodes i did uh it was a movie called eagle island uh i don't know did you did you catch that one at all that was I like one of the earlier episodes don't remember probably i mean it is all a blur after a while there's no way tim hasn't seen it let's right put yeah it that way. he true, might yeah. he might just not remember it yeah okay yeah well this is a swedish <laughs> film and we showed it and you can't find any information on it and then when i watched it to do the 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 show on it i'm like holy shit this is a good one it's uh it's so crazy but it's almost in the same vein as money movers yeah eagle island is just a uh, two female uh bird watching photographers go to this island they think is abandoned and it's actually run by russians and there's nazis on this island too so they're about to save they didn't know they're they're in this illegal island uh, filled with russians and ninjas, oh, russian so. nazis that's the worst i that is starting to sound familiar the one that i like that you covered was um it was like the uh south africa like apartheid vietnam horror action movie oh that was the stick yeah yeah that yeah one. that one yeah you know, I'm really hoping a lot of these movies get like a nice vinegar syndrome treatment or restoration because a lot of mm-hmm. these movies on there like are like really crappy VHS quality. But yeah, the stick was another one. That one, I believe, I don't know who the distributor on on that one. You'd have to probably uh, ask Ken. But uh, yeah, that one's just a lot of these ones went straight to the video stores and never even seen a DVD release. So yeah, and they're you know harder to find in any kind of good quality. I I was fortunate that Beast and Heat was just on a DVD. I thought that was I was gonna have to go through like some, uh, you know Indiana Jones esque you know, globe hopping uh, tour to like find an actual decent copy of it. But no, some like some sh- these... shady ass torrent site to find like a rip of an Italian like PAL yeah. DVD or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like some of these movies, too. I don't know if you guys caught the Grandpa Oates uh, Cinema Woodchipper show. It's Sundays at 10. Um, yeah, we, we show a bunch of, like, even more crazier rooms. I, I play a, a perverted old man on that show. And uh, we, we show, like, a, we're, we're showing Think Big. It stars, like, the uh, the Barbarian Brothers as truckers. Um, so we show just a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, there's also Revenge of Billy the Kid, which is a British Yes, I remember that movie. one. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll, that's a good one too. That's uh, that I, is perfect for what your show is about. Yep, yes. that is. It's sleazy. And uh, hey, Jennifer, have you have you seen a Revenge of Billy the Kid? I have not, but it sounds yeah. delightful. Yeah, Jen will go outside, unlike me. So I oh, okay. I watch a lot more B movie TV than she does. <laughs> uh, let's just I gotta say walk like, my uh, dog sometimes. Well, this one's an old uh, an old farmer fucks a goat, and he ends up uh, raising it as a, as a kid in the. When the goat gets older, it becomes this rebellious teenager and uh, starts killing the family. So, wow. Well, yeah, I think there's a life lesson in there for us all. To be there betrayed is, like yeah. that by your own kid, if you will. I know, literally, it's a kid. Oh, it's a joke. Oh, I get it. It's a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Doug, you, Ace, and the entire B Movie TV crew are doing hero's work. And uh, thank you for bringing us this movie because I enjoyed the fuck out of it. Yeah, well, this was great. Well, thank you guys, and it's people like you that make it, you know, really fun to to do. Because if we didn't have an audience, you know, it'd be like, man, who are you just doing this for? But um, <laughs> yeah, surprisingly, the channel's been doing really good. Um, you know, I I I, jo- I I teamed up with Ken and Mary D- Death, and uh, you know, the rest of the B movie crew. I think when the pandemic first started, so I had them show uh, my movie Gross House because they were like, I found B movie TV through Roku. I'm like, mm-hmm. hey, you guys are showing movies. Here's my movie. And then um, they played it on the channel, and they were like, oh, one of the guys from Friday Night Action, like, dropped out. Uh, and I'm like, well, shit. Like, I just made, like, a comment, like, oh, shit, well, I'll host it if you want. And, you know, t- how long has it been? The rest is history. Yeah, it's been. And during the pandemic in 2021, like, I was laid off my job. So I was doing episodes, cranking them out every week, every week, every week. But now that, you know, I'm back to full-time work and stuff, it's like I, I do two a month maybe, so. Nice. Yeah, and the, and the the format's changed a little. I mean, you had that um that imp and and Karen and then you kind of mixed it up a little. Oh, yeah, I got to bring them back. In fact, this new one here, uh there's a new episode of Friday Night Action uh this Friday actually. So, um 
Yeah, I've been hitting the gym, so I'm like, I gotta go into that full Rambo mode. So this one, I went like full <laughs> Rambo Commando with the with the headband. Karen and and uh, Karen is not coming back, and I'll, I'll tell you why because uh, we actually got Mary Death to uh, play Karen Feingold in uh, the movie Trash Juice that we're doing. So we turned her into a basically oh, that great. puppet. We turned her into a Mar- Mary Death's playing her. So that was <laughs> smart. She evolved like a Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she's in the segment The Shit Eaters uh, in the movie. So <laughs> <laughs> Now that is cinema that everyone can enjoy. Yeah, oh, and I, I got to say, this is kind of, I I want to, uh, I don't want to presuppose, but it seems like you're doing work kind of in like this trauma aesthetic. Like that's kind of your, your angle. I am. I've been a big fan. Well, I've got like a Toxie tattoo here. He was like my first tattoo when I was in the military. And then, you know, nice. I got full cheese zombie. So a lot of that stuff that... You know, I feel like I'd hate to say it's budgetary constraints, but it is budgetary constraints. <laughs> I, you know, You're working with what you got. Yeah, I'm working with like my savings, like two hundred and ten dollars to make a, you know, a segment for a movie. So it's it's not much, but you know, the B movie TV crew is great. Uh, the Slashers Pod crew is great too. They're all going to be in the movie as well. Um, nice. And like I said, like I, I'm, we're trying to expand B B movie TV. Uh, I think we talked to Ken about having it on. Prime, like the fire stick and stuff because i know roku's still kind of a select um audience mm-hmm. but i think roku's still the number one streaming platform uh, as opposed to like the chromecast and all that so well yeah i mean it's kind of there they take a a bigger piece of everything else because i mean there are niche players but it's like if you want any streaming service like roku supports that so they're pretty well positioned in my yeah. opinion yeah, yeah, don't join other worlds TV. They're the right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And honestly, like, Roku is for the cool people. Like us. Well, it yeah. is. Well, it's not just, you know, B-movie TV. Like, there's Pluto that I watch plenty of. There's Tubi, which has just been a godsend. Oh, like, yeah. It is, uh, you know, it's what we frequently say. It's what Netflix could have been. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. This all these you know unloved niche movies that actually turn out to be really interesting. So yeah, because um, you know it's uh, maybe a less than optimum presentation, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show. But if you want to watch Money Movers, it's on Tubi, free with ads. Yeah. So hey, and uh, you'll just see all kinds of wild shit on there. So you know, God bless the Roku, and of course, God bless B Movie TV. Right. <laughs> well, thank you guys. This this has been a lot of fun, and like I said, this is probably the most uh, info that we've put on uh, one of the movies that we've shown on Friday Night Action or Saturday Night Terrors and whatnot. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's been fun talking to you guys here. Um, there's uh, so Saturday Night Terrors with Yahira is uh, 10 p.m. on B Movie TV. Uh, Ken, you don't want to miss Ken shows on at 8 p.m. It's B Movie TV Classics. Uh, he shows whatever you know B movie sleaze is on, and then the livid videos of the week. Those are always fun. Yeah, so. yeah. If you Mary like, Death uh, is on at ten as well. So. If you enjoy violence and yeah. titties as much as we do, uh, you're gonna want to check out the livid videos of the week. <laughs> yeah, you know I'm watching it. And I, I even told Ken like, because uh, we, we, we film every Sunday. Um, mm-hmm. His movie, like Father Like Daughter, that's another plug for you too. So like right. Father Like Daughter, that should be out in October. Um, but yeah, we've been filming that every Sunday and then he films his uh, episodes in his, uh, B movie TV studios. And I said like, Ken, you know, you're, sh- what, what's so great about Ken's show. And then like just B movie TV in general, it feels so nineties. Like it feels like, <laughs> uh, it, like it, it's, it's so public access. Oh, we should be so lucky. Yeah. Yeah. And I even told, I'm like, Ken, you're like a, the real life version of auto from the Simpsons. Like, this just feels like if he had a public access show. <laughs> Like, you're gonna love this livid video man look at these titties flapping in the wind yeah yeah well i like the way he he gets in character by like having a joint before he shoots oh yeah yeah no literally i'm like hey ken you're looking at the monitor up there <laughs> look <at this> t- <laughs> honestly oh, it's respect. fun like literally it's 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 pure public access tv fun at its finest so yeah you don't take it too seriously you have a good time and that that definitely comes across yeah, and that's the kind of thing that we want to elevate on the show because we are all about kind of the um, the obscure, the overlooked, the shit that's a little right. weird. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what we want to talk about on here. So we appreciate you bringing it to us for this episode. Yeah, and um, the other... Oh, I forget his name. No, Paul, the guy who took over for... Um, 
Mr. Uh, Poe, yeah. Sh- yeah, mm-hmm. the, the sci-fi sideshow. That, um, yeah, and he's doing his, like, album reviews as well. Yeah, yeah, so he started his own little segment. It's uh, the the mu- uh, music moments. So, yeah. yeah, there's some good stuff in there. I'm like, hey, man, this is bringing me back to the days. I'm back in the days of Juggalos, you know? So. Yeah, and he was just, like, a guy on the, like, Facebook forum, as I yeah, recall. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was, he was a big fan on the Facebook, and... Um, uh, I think I think I think Aaron is still editing the episodes he sends, mm-hmm. but yeah. So that just shows you, like, literally, B Movie TV is like a public platform. Like, if you if you want to, you know, jump on there, you know, just message Ken because, like I said, look at that. I just made one comment, and he's like, "Oh, you want to host Friday Night Action from here on out?" So. <laughs> and yeah, it became because... a staple now too. I love getting these movies to watch because you know, yeah, you know, a lot some a lot of them are trash, but sometimes it's yeah. like, man, this is gold, you know. Yeah, every once yep. in a while you find a money movers. Ooh, that's good.